Thanks. Uh, good to see you all here and glad to hear that you had a good day. Uh, I'm David Musto. I've been in Waterton here for several years doing uh, a few different things with the White Bark program. Currently I'm with the resource management section and, and work on some of the restoration projects. And I've also done some work with volunteers who've helped us with the program. So tonight I'm going to give an overview of the white bark and limber pine restoration uh, work that we're doing in the park. It's something that we've been working on for a while here in Waterton as well as the other mountain parks and have support to continue uh, with the goal of improving the trend uh, in these species that are facing some challenges. So. So I'll just give a quick introduction to these species if you're not familiar with them. Uh, they're both uh, five needle pines, so they have five needles in a bunch as opposed to two like the lodgepole. They are slow growing trees uh, that grow at higher elevations, usually above a thousand meters, with limber being at lower elevations and white bark at higher, with a little bit of overlap in their uh, range. The white bark pine and also a bit the limber pine are considered keystone species in their uh, ecosystem for the role they play in holding snow and releasing it slowly, uh, colonizing soil and, and stabilizing soil. And then also as a food source for certain animals, uh, there's cl the Clark's nutcracker there um, and bears and squirrels that will use the very nutritious seeds that are quite similar to pine nuts that you'd buy in the store if you see them. They're a lot bigger than the seeds from other trees. Uh, these two maps show the distribution from where I'm standing it's kind of hard to see I don't know if you can all that well on the left uh, where there's the greenish blobs that's the distribution of white bark and on the right the bluish ones so the limber is more on the eastern slopes there where the white bark is more in the mountains and the black outlines are the mountain parks uh, that are all working on restoration of these species so the threats for both species are similar the main one being white pine blister rust. That's a rust native to Asia that was introduced accidentally to North America at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the picture shows an active canker from the white pine blister rust with spores on a tree. They're also susceptible to the pine beetle which is a native insect that sometimes can become hyperabundant and really stress the trees. Uh, fire suppression has contributed to the challenges with these trees as well because they like open areas and really benefit from from fires and uh, climate change being that they are a higher elevation species is an issue for them as well both have been listed in Alberta and white bark is listed federally uh, this slide shows a stand with a lot of dead trees on Mount Galway here in the park uh, which you might have seen part of if you're up Red Rock today for your Eskrim tour there's been health transects throughout the range uh, on these trees and in doing those transects they found within the five year period there was an increase in infection and mortality that you can see on the slides there. This year the transects were redone as well and in the process of doing those transects they locate certain trees that are in stands with a lot of infection and mortality that seem to be doing well and those trees are identified as plus trees that we can then use for restoration. And in Waterton, uh, as you can see, we have 87 white bark pine plus trees identified and 33 limber pine trees. So those are trees that we really want to protect. Um, and in order to do that, one of the things that we have are semi-chemical packets that uh, can be used to deter pine beetles. And there's two that we use one called verbenone and one green leaf volatile and those are affixed to the trees and they send a signal to the beetles to tell them that there isn't room in this tree and uh, another thing we do is cage the cones um, uh, you can see one of our staff climbing up there in the tree and we put these on the cones at the beginning of the season and uh, hopefully that deters things like the nutcracker and other animals from accessing those cones and then the seeds from those those plus trees are available to us for uh, restoration and we've been developing um, different systems for climbing the trees limber pine tend to be fairly easy to access and white bark although the ones we have are not terribly big you have to get right up into the crown of the tree to access the cones and uh, you know that can be a little bit of a challenge to, to protect from falls and so on so we're, we're working on developing our systems there 
Uh, we've collected a lot of seed, as you can see, about 30,000 white bark and 50,000 limber pine. And there's a few different places that they go. One is to uh, genetic testing, uh, rust resistant testing program uh, in the US. Another is just for conservation of genetics at the National Seed Centre in Canada. And the other place is two nurseries. There's one in Glacier National Park, Montana, and another in Smoky Lake, Alberta. And we send seeds there to be grown out into plugs that then we plant throughout the park um, and attempt to recolonize uh, some of the sites. This shows people planting in the bundles of trees that we get. Uh, they're usually about two years old. And we've planted in several sites here, about a thousand each year has been our goal uh, for planting, starting in 2009. This map, I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see, but for each year where we've been planting. Uh, the first year was in Upper Row Lakes area with white bark. The red ones are white bark and the yellow ones are limber. And then we did uh, Summit, Summit Lake, and that was in conjunction with prescribed fire. And then we did some on Lakeview Ridge, way out there, and uh, the Lynham Ruby Ridge area. And most recently we've done limber pine planting above Red Rock Canyon and white bark in Blue Grouse Basin where we also did some fire. And over here on Vimy, Mount Vimy across the lake is where we're intending to plant this year. And we've already completed uh, prescribed fire up there. And in planting, we've gone back and monitored those sites to see how the seedlings are doing. And uh, just looking at if they're still alive, how well they're growing, what their health is, if they're dying, what the cause of death was. We've also partnered with researchers from Montana State University to look at different effects of certain site characteristics or site preparations on the success of the trees. And just recently in uh, the Nutcracker Notes, which is a publication from the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, some of the results from what they found at Summit Lake, where we've had now three years of data, uh, were published in an article there. And they're looking, like I said, at different site preparation treatments. Overall, in the third year, uh, we had 47% survival at that site at Summit Lake. So one of the things I already mentioned was the fire. And the type of fire that we do in those sites isn't uh, like the fire on the right, where um, you're igniting an area and letting the whole thing burn. Because of course, we don't want to kill the plus trees that are in the area. We want to preserve those trees and just target the competing fir and spruce and sometimes even the ground vegetation, the bare grass uh, can have an impact on the success of the seedlings as well. So the tool we use is the one on the left called the Terra Torch and that allows the crew to select um, specific trees and just burn them individually. And in some ways that's also mimicking lower intensity lightning strikes that would not have created a big fire, but just uh, created smaller openings in those areas for the white bark pine trees. And in areas where there's been <coughs> fire, we've had the highest uh, success rates, um, around 50% uh, survival or more in areas where there was some bar burning. Another thing they looked at was the presence of mycorrhizal fungi, which is associated with the trees and of course since if you remember that picture of uh, uh, Galway there's a lot of trees dead in that, in that picture in that stand and so a lot of the important mycorrhizal fungi associated with those tree species presumably was also removed uh, with those trees dying so they looked at harvesting it elsewhere and integrating that into the, the plugs when they plant them and that increased uh, the success after year three by about 11 percent. So that's something that we're going to continue to do. As well as planting um, in sheltered spots or uh, some kind of small microsite. And uh, the idea for that is to maybe give the tree a little bit of shade, a little bit better um, water retention in that site. And in thinking of natural uh, ways that might be achieved, the Clark's Nutcracker uh, that disperses seeds um, will cache over the winter. So it, well, the way that they find them again is mostly through memory mapping. So 
cues where there would have been, say, a burned log or a big rock. It thought is that uh, that's part of how it's occurring naturally as well. And that, uh, in year three, improved survival by about 18% if it was planted in a, in a microsite like that. The other thing is planting them in clumps. So uh, the nutcrackers are able to gather several seeds at a time and they'll plant little clumps of them. And I was thinking there, so they attempted with uh, different combinations of single tree, two trees, three trees, and found that three to five seedlings was uh, ended up with the highest success rate.